As news continues to roll out about Dan Didio's exit from DC, um, what does it all mean? So I wanted to go ahead and answer 10 questions, kind of the 10 common questions that I'm already seeing posted a bunch of places. This will be a bit of prediction, a bit of just answering your questions, and try and wrap our hands around what's going to happen now. Hey everybody, this is Perch. Um, talking comics, cocking uh, Dan Didio out at DC. What does it all mean? I did a video already kind of with the initial take on what's happened. Even in the last 60 minutes, a lot more news is coming out. We're starting to get a clear picture, starting to talk to some people within the company, a couple of editor friends of mine, getting some, some good insights about what's being said internally. So I wanted to take this opportunity to answer 10 questions, just 10 kind of common questions that keep coming up. And, uh, and about the situation and what's going to happen next. Um, you know, here's the first. Will AT&T sell DC Comics now or just license out the comics? Um, the answer is no. They're certainly not going to sell it. They're not going to shutter the division and they're not going to license it out. And there's a couple reasons why. First, let's attack each question individually. Um, will they actually sell DC? Well, no. I mean, first of all, AT&T Time Warner is heavily heavily vested in making the DC universe work. And it's easy to get caught up in kind of the initial Birds of Prey underperformed or what's going on with the Titan series or these kinds of things. But the reality is DC's movies, uh, you think about Joker, we think about Shazam, we think about Aquaman, Wonder Woman, their movie properties are actually doing decent. Are they doing the Marvel universe well? No, but they're doing very well by movie standards. And at and needing to have a streaming service, needing to kind of compete with some of these big guys, they view the DC history and the lore as one of their most valuable, if not their most valuable asset in that library. So no, they're not going to sell it off. Now, are they going to license a comics? Well, they might, but there's there's one big problem with that, and that is who would they license it to? Uh, we're going to take Marvel off the table. Obviously, they're not going to license DC Comics off to their primary competitor, Disney, in this space. That's just not going to happen. So once you take them off the table, you're left with Image. Well, Image doesn't do licensing deals like this, and it's completely in, you know, in, in opposition to their business model and how they're structured. That would be a catastrophic change for Image, and they would be the only one even close to being able to be in a position to do something like that. Because when you license properties, you have to commit to the parent company that you're going to meet certain revenue targets, that you're going to do things. It's not just that some random small company, like I, I saw somebody, people posted that, hey, a bunch of us here in uh, Comicsgate should pool our cash together and do a GoFundMe and, and buy DC or license it. They're not going to do that uh, for a huge number of reasons. First of all, you couldn't come up with the money necessary. Second, part of licensing is establishing a partner that's going to stick with you for five to 10 years. It's not going to damage your brand. And I don't mean that you know, a bunch of uh, people, independent comic makers, um, are going to damage it ideologically. I mean, you need to give it to a company that's going to commit to marketing it, promoting it, putting books out, and not actually making your brand seem smaller than it is. DC already struggles with having more recognizable characters in Superman, Batman, and others, but seen as second to Marvel. They're not going to double down on that by putting themselves in the position of going to an IDW or a Boom or a Vault or a uh, Dark Horse or anybody like that. That lowers their profile, and they won't do that. Uh, second question, you know, what does DC want to do with, or sorry, what does AT&T want to do with DC long term? Well, that's easy. They want to generate some IP, they want to do it cheaply, and they want to continue to, uh, you know, basically test out a lot of these characters and concepts in a, in a method that's way cheaper than doing it on film. And this sounds very, very strange, but uh, being able to produce a comic and try out a property and introduce a new character, it's one one hundredth of the cost. That's exaggerating a little bit, but it's far cheaper to do that in comics, test the waters, get things put out, get some brand recognition, get a groundswell going. And frankly, in pop culture, the idea that it came from a comic book is seen as a plus. So they want to have really solid, stable IP they can pull from. Now, you might say, but wait a minute, they've been telling 80 years worth of stories. They've got more than enough. Yeah, not really, though. They need to continue to have stuff that's new, that's timely, that's feeling like it's coming out right now, that's current and modern and relevant. So 
they're going to continue to put out stories. They're going to continue to try things. They're going to continue to build this this story because it's pennies on the dollar for what they would spend in their other enterprises. And so if you're AT&T, even if it's not making tons and tons of money, it's still far more valuable than doing it pretty much any other way. This is, this is good business for them. Now, I will say that you're going to see a lot more control from AT&T. Uh, you know, back in August, but I've been saying it for years, we we're going to hit a time probably in 2020, 2021, well, here we are, where the big corporations, both Disney and AT&T, were going to clamp down control. I mean, think Rebirth, which Jeff Johns really teed up perfectly to be a, a wonderful way to just tell classic stories, classic heroes would translate well to the screen. I mean, he was aligning the comic industry with what they wanted to do with movies really effectively. And then um, Metal came along, and that was seen as a, a wild and crazy ride, but still, um, for all the, the criticism some people have had about Snyder's metal and how it was crazy and everything else, it still felt like the big bombastic superhero adventure that fit within, within Rebirth. Doomsday Clock definitely fit within Rebirth of this idea of hope and optimism. What didn't fit within Doomsday Clock? Well, Heroes in Crisis, turning Wally West into crazy murder, um, having this long drawn out Batman depressing storyline, doing what they've done with Superman of having him reveal his secret identity to the world. And, and is he or is he not cheating on Lois and or Lois cheating on him? Sorry, it, all this kind of stuff, it doesn't work. So you're going to see AT&T take a much more active piece of control over DC. Absolutely. Um, third question, is this all because of 5G? Well, no, I don't believe so because I don't think that anybody at AT&T is paying that close attention to 5G. But I do think there is an element of truth to having Didio step out because, number one, his big bet on Bindus, and we'll get to that in a minute, did not pan out. But number two, as we're now seeing some stories circulating out, hearing what editors and other people are saying, um, you know, Didio's vision for the company was in opposition to telling good, clean, easily consumable stories from Hollywood. That, that is a problem. And if you're going to release a new Wonder Woman and you, you've got Death Metal coming out where Wonder Woman's kind of a, you know, a big hero in that story in a different way, okay, that works. If you're going to make more DC comics and, or movies and more things for your streaming service and meanwhile you've replaced all of the core DC characters like they're talking to do with 5G, that doesn't work. That's, that's a, a problem. It's basically taking the comics and they're making them unrecognizable to the movies. Now, wait a minute, you might say, if the movies have, you know, 20x the audience or more that the comics have, who cares? Well, DC's executives care if the whole point to doing the comics is to provide some nice IP and do some things that are going to help kind of generate some interest and excitement and test some ideas out for the movies. If you're off in kind of some other world of telling random stories, then you really are not in alignment with their, with their plans. And in my mind, I think the death and killing of Alfred, particularly the way it was done and the way it all came out, that I think is the biggest problem of all. Uh, question number four, were Didio and John's, uh, Jeff John's enemies? Um, the answer is uh, enemies may be too strong a word, but they certainly didn't like each other. Uh, everybody from inside and outside notes that there was there's definite stress between the two. Um, they respect, you know, they they maintained a professional courtesy to the to each other, but it was not a friendly relationship. And uh, there was a lot of kind of crowing on the part of Didio's part when John's uh, his story was kind of not sabotaged, but interfered with with uh, Doomsday Clock. He was late, and uh, things moved on, and and there were a lot of internal kind of jokes made about Rebirth and some of uh, Jeff John's statements that were made there that Didio didn't necessarily agree with. And so there's there's a lot going on there that you know I think there's a feeling from Didio's side that John's blamed him for the end of New Fifty Two, and so you know there, there's just a lot of kind of back and forth. Um, I, they were not friends by any stretch of the imagination, and it's interesting to see this is the result where Johns has kind of moved upward in the organization. We're about to get to that too, um, and Didio is now on the outside. Uh, question number five, did Jeff Johns sabotage Didio from above? You know, that's an interesting question. It's probably the most interesting question because Johns is up trying to kind of work with AT&T and Time Warner on a very important thing for them, which is their streaming service and these movies and, and all the rest. So um, does that mean that Jeff Johns had the ear of some higher level executives to say, hey, you know what, my job would be a hell of a lot easier if it wasn't pandemonium chaos town back in the comics. 
I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, we saw this play out with Kevin Feige and with Marvel, with the Creative Council, with Casada uh, uh, and uh, Bendis and others, and how Feige was able to basically separate himself from it. Um, and as it played out, you know, years later, to their detriment, uh, you know, Casada kind of demoted, uh, Bendis out, and Feige in charge of publishing. Here we have now, um, you know, Jeff Johns is in a position of definitely some influence. And the reports that we're getting as AT&T and executives were dissatisfied with the kind of random direction and wanted DC Comics to focus on, you know, for lack of a better word, the bread and butter, the, the core heroes creating, you know, big known stories that were going to be remembered forever, not strange, introspective, uh, wandering nonsense. So, uh, yeah, I, I definitely think, um, I don't think, a sabotage is too strong a word, but mm, there's probably a story there. Uh, question six, what does this mean for Scott Snyder, Tom King, and others? Well, um, Snyder, you know, made some very public comments saying that, you know, after this big storyline, uh, he'd be doing creator-owned work and uh, Undiscovered Country is uh, doing very well. And so um, I wouldn't be surprised if either that played into some of this or at least um, at the top level, they're saying, look, we have a creator, Scott Snyder, who um, generated a ton of money with metal. You can put a lot of uh, you know, money on him and what he did. You have Tom King, who, uh, you know, despite what a lot of social media says about he blew up Batman and everything else, he can claim credit for pretty strong financial numbers from DC over the last two to three years. He does have that. That is a fact. That's not a, a lie. Um, you can always argue that, you know, a different writer could have done more with Batman than King did, but we, we don't know. We yeah. do know that King was there. We do know that it was one of the top selling titles. You could certainly say all day long that, you know, Batman would sell even if, uh, you know, anybody was writing it. But, you know, okay, that, that may be true. We can speculate on that. But what we do know is facts, and we do know that those guys brought in big numbers. And we also know that Scott Snyder is saying he wants to kind of work his way out. There's an undercurrent of dissatisfaction, at least, that's been communicated, whether it's true or not. And we know that Tom King is up doing movies, and he's kind of out of the spotlight as well. So there is a kind of clearing out of... Uh, now, basically, you know, Didio is there and his guy Bendis is there. And, and so, you know, um, what does this mean for Snyder and others? Probably big opportunity to come in and take some control if they want it. Um, what does this mean for Bendis? Well, that's a really good question. Um, it's It's been um, said, and it's true, that Didio kind of aligned himself with Bendis. He was really responsible for bringing Bendis over. And that was his, his, his coup. Um, Bendis's um, entry into DC has been extremely rocky. It has not been seen as a success story by any any account. Uh, nobody except the, the very, very deluded are saying that that's been wildly successful. Now, some, and they may be right, are saying it will take some time and, and Bendis will grow and build into this role. But so far, you know, Bendis's take on characters has been kind of uh, the opposite of some of the things that Jeff John set up. It caused a couple creators to leave DC in anger. And his friends that he brought with him, uh, G. Willow Wilson, uh, Kelly Sue DeConnick, Matt Fraction, they were put on Aquaman, Wonder Woman, uh, you know, and, and Jimmy Olsen, of course. But um, they were put on some pretty big titles, and we did not see the sales bump of, of G. Willow Wilson on Wonder Woman. We did not see a sales bump on Aquaman with uh, Kelly Sue. So, And we did not see a sales bump at all out of Superman and the others. Now, the one thing I'd temper this with is that Bendis writes comics, in particular Legion of Superheroes, some of these others, with a kind of fresh, modern take, if you will, that does, from a Hollywood perspective, tend to translate well to cartoons or movies or streaming things. That's how Hollywood views a lot of what Bendis does. They view him as, as writing in a Hollywood-friendly way, whether it's true or not. So it's hard to really say if you know, Bendis's take on Legion of Superheroes, some of these other books, is going to be seen as uh, a good thing by these characters. If it's if you know bringing in Leviathan and some of these other things uh, modernize the Manhunters and Mark Shaw to a way that is appealing, it might. So there's a possibility that Bendis uh, benefits from all this. But what I I think is also true is Bendis's kind of uh, overarching control over uh, so many things is going to get scaled back. I think that is. You know, the eggs in one basket scenario, I think, is is going to go away. And, and now with Didio does not have his back, he's going to have to work on, you know, merit. And and again, you know, two halves of the coin. I think he has done some things that Hollywood and AT&T Time Warner will like and will want to adapt. And I think he's done other things that go away from that classic, traditional, 
um, telling some core stories feeling. Um, question number eight, are we going to now get re-rebirth? Um, yeah, I think we are. Um, now, I don't think it's going to be called that, and I don't believe we're ever going to see kind of an acknowledgement like we did with Rebirth, but I absolutely see that uh, after Death Metal, uh, after whatever kind of break we get from uh, 5G, depending on how 5G happens, I think we're going to get a, re a return to heroes. You're going to see what kind of like what Bendis, um, the marketing side of what Bendis did with the heroic age at Marvel after Dark Reign, you are going to see that kind of return to classics, return to heroes as we know them and heroes that we can be, you know, recognized, we'll be proud of telling big, huge stories, um, probably getting some, some, uh, new writers, uh, who outside of comics have some experience telling these big stories. Um, yeah, I absolutely think we're going to get something like that. So be prepared for a big marketing push, either right after Death Metal or soon after for you know the return of the heroes. I think something like that. Uh, question number nine. So who's going to get Dan Didio's job? Um, probably nobody, at least not right away. Or, or actually, there's two answers to this. Uh, the first one is I think Jim Lee will just be publisher for a while. We won't. Uh, he's been co-publisher with Dan Didio. We're just going to see Jim Lee as publisher. Um, but the other thing, who's going to get his job longer term? Um, AT&T executive group number four. That's who's going to get his job. It's going to be much more tightly controlled by AT&T Time Warner Committee. And whoever gets put in there is going to be seen as somebody who's going to be a good company guy. I wouldn't be surprised to see Jeff Johns emerge back into the scene to some extent, but it's not going to be the way it was. It's going to be very, very corporate controlled and um, in alignment with the big media efforts they want to do. Question number 10, where will Dan Didio go? Well, most likely nowhere for a period of time. Chances are in his exit, uh, he got severance and he got a you know one year, three year non-compete. So he's going to have a lot of money. He's going to make some comments, probably less comments than you think because he'll have a He'll have a, a non-disclosure that will be part of his package, and I think he'll be quiet for a while. And then I think he'll wash up in uh, you know one of the same kind of deals as Axel Alonso did. You know, go and join some entity like that. I think he'll be a consultant for a period of time. But uh, I don't think he's going to Marvel. I don't think that uh, you know maybe this is you know two or three years he shows up at Valiant, something like that. Who knows? Um, he's definitely got some credibility on his side that he can say, I brought the new 52. I did some major things for DC. Hey, look, you may not have liked me. You may have liked what I did, but I did run the number two publisher for a while, and I was number one for several of those years too. So I'm the only person that's proven to have beaten Marvel at various times. And, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have to you're going to have to acknowledge that. So I think he'll have a future somewhere. I think he's going to be quiet for a period of time. Um, maybe we're all in for a treat and he just flames out and goes on some kind of crazy obscene rant over the next 24 hours, which would be awesome. But chances are we're not going to get that. Anyway, those are 10 questions, 10 answers. I hope that helped uh, kind of put some things out there for you in regards to Dan Didio exiting DC, where it all goes from here. Hope this was helpful. Ask some questions below. I'll try and answer them. Follow me on Twitter at Comic Perch. Like, subscribe, please. Would love to have uh, your, your, you know, join me on this uh, amazing comic journey. Most importantly, thank you for listening.